The Challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on Huskies! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush with Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Sergeant Preston was sent down to San Francisco to pick up Red Gavin, who was wanted for murder in Whitehorse. He took King with him. The tall, broad-shouldered, red-coated Mountie attracted a great deal of attention in the city. But people were even more interested in King, a real lead dog, a veteran of the fabulous Yukon Trail. The men at police headquarters were no exception, and there was no work done until the sergeant and King were ushered into the superintendent's office. How do you do, sergeant? Please sit down. Thank you, sir. This is Lieutenant Powell, who captured Red Gavin. My congratulations, Lieutenant. Oh, yes. That's a great dog you have there. I think so. It's a beauty. I've never seen one like him. Does he mind if you pet him a bit? Oh, not at all. <laughs> I, uh... Good boy. Brought him along so I wouldn't have to be handcuffed to Gavin all the way back to the Yukon. King will guard him for me. Oh, uh, you'd better tell the sergeant the sad news, sir. Sad news? Yes, it's, uh, It's true that Gavin was captured and we had him in jail waiting for him, but... He isn't there now. He broke out the night before last. The men responsible have been disciplined. But it isn't as bad as it might be. We know where Gavin is hiding out, and at least we're fairly certain. And Farrell will pick him up again tonight. That's fine. Well, I hope to be picking him up again tonight. He's hiding out in the Barbary Coast. And though the reputation of that district may not have reached the Yukon... Indeed it has. Well, then you'll know that making the arrest may turn out to be a little difficult. They're a tough lot down there on the waterfront. Well, believe me, Lieutenant, I realize perfectly what the San Francisco police are up against, and I'd consider it an honor if you'd let me go with you tonight. Would you now? I'd like to see you in action. Well, I see no reason why the sergeant shouldn't go with you, Farrell. Well, begging your pardon, sir, I do. I have one faint objection. Sergeant, we're not accustomed to invading the Barbary Coast wearing red coats. Did you ever hear what happened to the red coats who marched up Bunker Hill? As I remember it, they marched down again. Mm. Only a few of them. Those red coats made wonderful targets. Well, I don't have to be in uniform, Lieutenant. I could wear plain clothes. That's true. And maybe you should come along with me. I'd like to. You look like a man with a taste for adventure. And we ought to provide you with a little entertainment before you go back to your routine duties. <laughs> routine duties? I apologize for him, Sergeant. He evidently hasn't heard of the Northwest Mounted's record. Oh, indeed I have, sir. Indeed I have. It's perfect. And that's what makes me feel that they can't be up against such spell peens as we have on the Barbary <laughs> Coast. Well, perhaps you're right, Lieutenant. Is it agreed about tonight? Yes, sir, it is. I'll pick you up at your hotel at 11 o'clock. Lieutenant Farrell drove up to the Sergeant's hotel that evening in a shiny black touring car. The sergeant and King were waiting at the curb. This is a wonderful car, Lieutenant. Yes, it's a new Winton. Makes 30 miles an hour. Oh? Sergeant Preston, meet Muldoon. How are you, sir? And Jenkins. How do you do? And Ford. How do you do? Now, where are you going to leave the dog? Why, uh, can't I take him with me, Lieutenant? Just what do you think you're going on, man? A picnic? No, not at all, but King might be able to help. And how do you figure that? Well, I have a glove here that belonged to Gavin. I've let King smell it, and he'll trail the man who wore it no matter where he goes. Oh, we know where Gavin is. Well, I thought in case he got away. Oh, he won't. And besides, there is no dog can trail a scent in the Barbary Coast. There's too many of them. You'll have to leave him behind. And can he ride with us, Lieutenant, and stay in the car? I promise he won't even bark. He minds perfectly. Let him come, Mike. We could use a mascot. Well, all right, all right. But mind you, keep him quiet. We want no barking dogs announcing our arrival. He'll be quiet. In you go, boy. All right, Jenkins. Crank the motor. Yes, sir. King lay down at his master's feet. This was the first time he'd ever ridden in an automobile. And his instinct was to jump out and leave the strange coughing monster as far behind as possible. 
He was trembling until the sergeant laid a reassuring hand on his head. It's all right, boy. A moment later, his master held a glove in front of his nose. Fine, King. He understood the quiet command, and he raised his head a little to search the breeze, but there was no scent for him to follow. Fifteen minutes later, when the monster came to a stop and became wonderfully quiet, King knew they were near the sea. Now, that's the place across the street. Jenkins? Yes, sir. You and Forbes get around to the waterfront end of it. We'll be coming through the cafe in ten minutes. Now get going. All right, Lieutenant. Ten minutes passed. Now, Sergeant. Stay here, King. Be quiet, boy. Come on, Muldoon. Follow me. All right, Lieutenant. King waited nervously for his master to return. And when he heard a volley of shots inside the cafe across the street, he was unable to hold back a growl. But he stayed where he was in the back seat of the car, watching the door of the cafe where his master had disappeared. Then he heard another sound. A man was climbing out the second story window of the cafe. He dropped to the ground and started to run. King had a bad moment. He caught the man's scent and knew he was the one the sergeant wanted to find. But the sergeant had told him to stay in the car. King's intelligence was equal to the problem, though. To find the man and follow him was the more important command. King leaped from the car and started out in pursuit. Five minutes later, the sergeant and the detectives came out of the cafe with two prisoners and crossed the street to the car. Mueller, pulling that gun on us is going to send you to prison for ten years. I didn't know who you were. Oh, yes, you did. And you know where Gavin is. You had him in that place of yours. <laughs> you ought to get some new stool pigeons. I haven't seen Gavin since he was arrested. Uh, you get in there. All right. Hey, Sergeant, the dog's gone. Yes, I see. I thought he always obeyed your orders. He does. He wouldn't have left here without a good reason. Well, we haven't got time to look for him. Listen, I hear him. Well, you better call him fast. Somewhere down on the waterfront. I'll go and get him, Lieutenant, but I think you'd better come with me. Why? Because King would not have left this car except to follow Red Gavin. Are you daft, man? I mean it. And he isn't far away. It'll only take a minute. All right, since you're a guest of the force, I'll humor your notions. Watch these two, Muldoon. Right, Lieutenant. Let's go, Sergeant. The sergeant and the lieutenant ran down the street toward the sound of King's barking. They cut between two buildings to reach the docks. And at last, they saw King standing at the water's edge. There was an old sailor near him. King, what's the trouble, boy? That dog belonged to you. Yes. You ought to chain him up. Why? what do you do? What's happened? There was a guy getting into a rowboat, and this dog comes streaking towards him, jumped right at his throat. Lucky the guy had a belaying pin in his hand. He gave him a crack over the head. He wouldn't have got away otherwise. What did the man look like? Uh, he's red-headed, husky. Red Gavin. Which way did he go? Who are you? I'm Farrell of the Homicide. Here's my badge. That redhead's wanted for murder. Now, which way did he go? Out of that schooner, the one that's just getting underway. Come on, Sergeant. The harbor patrol boat is at the next wharf. We'll catch the schooner before it clears the gate. On King! The skipper of the harbor patrol boat knew the lieutenant well. And in a matter of minutes, he had the boat cutting through the choppy waters of the bay toward the schooner. She was under full sail and driving toward the Golden Gate with the help of a brisk offshore breeze. But the patrol boat had speed and overhauled her. Give her a signal to hog too. Aye, aye, Lieutenant. Look, like that'll do the trick. No, I don't. Shall I put a shot across your bow? Yes. Ready, forward. Aye, aye, sir. Ready to fire. Fire. Now there's some activity on her deck. She knows we mean business. They'll be hauling down their sails. Stand by to board the schooner. The schooner's sails were furled, and she wallowed in the choppy sea as the patrol boat came up alongside. At an order from the police skipper, a rope ladder was dropped from the deck, and Farrell and half a dozen men from the patrol boat started up it. The sergeant lifted King in his arms. You taking the dog aboard, sergeant? He's mighty big to carry up that ladder. We can make it. King can find Gavin no matter where he's hiding. Up we go, boy. When the sergeant and King reached the deck of the schooner, the crew was lined up. They say Gavin isn't aboard, sergeant. You're not yes. taking their word for it. No, of course not. Sent three men down to the hold, and the others are searching the cabins and between decks. But half an hour later, when the men reported back to Farrell, they had been unable to find Gavin. The lieutenant lost his temper. What do you mean, not on board? He must be. We'd have seen him if he'd have gone over the side. Now get down below again and find him. May King and I go this time, lieutenant? Yes, and I'm going too. Clearly. Yes, sir. You and Adams, keep an eye on this gang. We'll take care of it. Yes, Lieutenant. 
At the foot of the companionway between decks, the sergeant spoke to King. Find him, boy. King barked and started forward. Farrell and the sergeant followed him, and the dog led them directly to the folks. This must be the place, Lieutenant. As you can see, he isn't here. Those lockers are too small to hide a man. All the bunks are empty. He's sniffing at the flooring. Perhaps he's underneath the deck. There's only the hold below. We've searched that. He isn't down there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've got it. Why, the dog's smarter than you are. There's probably a trap door somewhere around here, but we won't bother looking for it. All of you, get some tools and rip up this planking. Go on now, get to work. What's your idea, Lieutenant? I guess that they've been using this schooner to smuggle aliens in. Oh? They've probably got a snug little compartment built just below this deck. We'll soon find out. And when the planking had been ripped away, the lieutenant's guess was proved to be correct. There was a compartment, and Red Gavin was hiding in it. You're covered, Red. Now climb up out of there. You're going back to jail. The evening's adventure was finished. Red was returned to jail. And during the next few days, the extradition proceedings were completed. The sergeant was scheduled to sail for the Yukon with his prisoner on the following morning when he received a message from the superintendent asking him to stop in at his office. He reported at once and found Lieutenant Farrow also waiting for his chief. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Do you have any idea why the superintendent wants to see me? Oh, he probably wants to say goodbye. I'm glad of the chance myself. <laughs> I appreciate all you've done for me, Lieutenant. Oh, not at all, not at all. Did you enjoy that taste of excitement I gave you the other night? Yes, indeed. I felt as if I'd stepped right into the middle of Treasure Island. Uh, Treasure Island? Oh, the smuggler schooner, you mean? <laughs> oh, that's nothing new around here. We have pirates, too. There's the Black Hounds gang, for instance. Oh, Sergeant, it'd do my heart good if I had you and King working with me when we went after them. Look now, uh, would you consider it at all? I'm sorry, King, and I must go back to the Yukon where uh, nothing ever happened. Oh, now, that's a shame, a shame. I tell you, I couldn't stand it myself. Excitement is meat and drink to me. I couldn't do without it. Uh oh here's the old man now. Hello, Farrell. Good afternoon, Sergeant. How do you do, sir? We'll get down to business right away. Well, you're going to the Yukon with the sergeant. I... I'm what? Here's your ticket. Perhaps the sergeant will help you buy whatever you need in the way of clothes and supplies this afternoon. Well, now, wait a minute. What's this all about? I'm in no need of a rescuer, if that's what you're planning for me, sir. This is duty, pal. Link Davis and Ben Walters have been seen in Dawson. They're bank robbers, sergeant. Wanted for murder, too. I'm sure the Northwest Mounted will help Farrell track them down. You can depend on it, sir. When they're caught, it will be up to you to bring them home, Mike. Sergeant, will it be much of a job picking them up? Why, uh, not if they're in Dawson. It's only a small town. Now, once they're caught, it'll be a simple matter getting them home. Do you hear that, sir? Couldn't one of the newer men take over this assignment? I don't want to leave town. I've set my heart on going after the Black Count. That's out, Mike. Out? I'm sorry. I've uh, just been talking to Washington. The Secret Service is taking over. The case is out of our hands completely. Oh, you, you don't say. Uh, well, if that's the sad state of affairs, I suppose there's no reason why I shouldn't take a vacation up in the Yukon. And that was how Mike Farrell happened to accompany the Sergeant and King on their return trip to the Yukon. When they reached the territory, winter had already set in. Red Gavin was delivered to the authorities in Whitehorse. And Mike and the sergeant headed north on the Yukon Trail by dog sled. On King! Mike was completely unimpressed by everything he saw. Fine thing for a grown man to be riding around on a sled. <laughs> I feel like a six-year-old out for a day's tobogganing. We're having good weather, Mike. Sometimes the trail can be pretty rough. I ought to be back on the job. Well, maybe we'll be able to scare up some excitement for you in Dawson. I doubt it. So do I. Especially after what you're used to in San Francisco. On King! Events conspired against Mike's desire for excitement. The trip to Dawson was made in record time over a hard-packed trail. The weather was mild, and so was the boom town when they reached it. It was nearly deserted, for there had been a new strike north of the Bonanza. Hey. So this is Dawson, hmm? And this is the famous Monte Carlo Cafe. Ah. 
What a fine funeral parlor it would make. Well, nearly every one who doesn't have some sort of business in town has gone up to Nugget Creek. Now, what about the two men I've come after? I just had a talk with Tex Rickard, the owner of the place, and he remembers them, but uh, they left when the rush started. And I suppose that means another toboggan party for us. You can stay here if you want to, Mike. I'll go after them. Oh, what would I do waiting for you? No, man, it's better to have a little action than none at all. Let's get started at once. I'll need the rest of the day to get our supplies together. Oh, what? Or a few cans of beans is all we need. There's no telling how long we'll be gone. Might be a few days. Might be a couple of months. A couple of... Will you say that again? We may not find Davis and Walters at Nugget Creek, and we can't expect any more fine weather. We're due for a cold snap. Well, it happens to be about zero now. Well, I'm speaking of 40 or 50 below. Yes, I, I understand. Naturally, no human being could go out in weather like that. Oh, we'll go out. It's only a blizzard that might hold us up. When the wind gets up to 60 or 70 miles an hour, it's impossible to fight it. 60 or 70 miles an hour? Huh. Yes. Oh, I think you're pulling my leg, Sergeant. You're just trying to pull an element of danger into this business. Well, I'll admit we don't often have gills like that. I'll bet you don't. Still, it's just as well to be prepared, Mike. We'll start the first thing in the morning. There seemed to be no concern, no reason for concern, about the weather. The sun shone and the sky was clear during the three days it took them to reach Nugget Creek. But after inquiring up and down the creek, they learned that Davis and Walters had arrived too late to stake a claim and had gone on. The sergeant shook his head when he learned the direction they had taken. North by northeast, Mike. That takes us into rough country. Can you follow them? Yes, they... Had to break a fresh trail. There hasn't been any snow since they left. King won't have any trouble. Well, then let's get going. Let's pick up the spell, Peen, so I can go back home to a place where there's something happening. Climb on board the sled. I'm ready. All right. All right, go to it. Untangle! <laughs> Lieutenant Michael Farrell wanted excitement. He had his first taste that afternoon. The trail led to an Indian village in the wooded country at the foot of the Sawtooth Range. The place seemed deserted as the sergeant drove into it and stopped the team. Bulking! Oh, you have to Hold on! And then a second later, the sergeant and Mike were surrounded by a horde of Indians, shouting war cries and brandishing knives and spears. Sergeant, what have we got into? Go for your gun! Oh, hold your fire. One shot and they'll use their spears. That's what they mean to kill us. Our only chance is to talk them out of it. Talk! Leave it to me. We come in peace. Take us to your chief. At the sergeant's words, the Indians rushed forward and taking hold of the sergeant and Mike, pulled them toward the largest hut in the village. King would have tried to interfere, but a word from the sergeant stopped him. Easy, boy. What do you think they're going to do? I know the chief. I'm going to find out what this is all about. Well, I can tell you that. They're going to kill us. You'll want the excitement, Mike. But I don't want to be murdered. This is all in the day's work. The chief will listen to reason. Oh, to reason, he says. Is that him standing in the door of the cabin? Yes. Ragano. Try and escape. Right, fire. Oh, they're going to burn us alive. He'll listen to reason, you say. Ragano. Tell your warriors to let us go. We're friends. No, white man. Friend of Indians. You know that is not true. Uh, white men come here. We give food, shelter. Them steal nugget god. Run away. A nugget god, is it? Probably a big nugget. It looks something like a man. Tell us about the Nugget God, Ragano. It charm against winter. Now winter bad. No game, no food. Many Indian die. How long ago was it the white men stole it? Last night. Davis and Walters. Must have been. Ragano, those men are not only enemies of the Indians, they're our enemies. We're trailing them, and when we catch them, they'll be hanged. You not catch them. Indian trail into canyon where ghost pack stay. No man lives who enter canyon. We have strong medicine against the ghost pack. Let us go on to the canyon. We'll capture the men and bring your nugget god back. Oh, what? What are they talking about? We're deciding whether to let us go or not. And what was that about a canyon where the ghost pack lives? Nothing but superstition, Mike. They believe there are werewolves in the canyon. And... What are werewolves? Men who have taken the form of wolves and only prey on human beings. Oh, now there's a pleasant thought. And what strong medicine do you have against such things as that? If there are wolves in the canyon, they aren't ghosts. We can take care of them with our guns. Look, the Indians have made their decision. 
Will you let us go, Regano? Uh, but only one way go in the canyon. Are you sure the men are still in there? Uh, warrior, stand guard at opening. This is working out well, Mike. Well, I don't like any part of it. But don't you see? Davis and Walters went into a blind canyon. They can't get out because the Indians are guarding the entrance. All we have to do is go in after them. We're ready, Regano. Warriors follow you. Stay at opening. You go in. You not come out without men and nugget guard. We agree to your terms. Uh, Can we reach the canyon before it gets dark? Uh, then we'll start right away. You wait for warriors to harness team. Whatever you say, Chief. The sergeant and Mike left the village with one Indian sled in front of them and half a dozen behind. They were still under guard. And it was clear the Indians believed they were being led to their execution, to a death as certain as the stake. Suddenly, the temperature began to drop, and the wind from the north increased in violence. The sky was clear, but the snow whipped from the ground was driven against their faces with stinging violence. Keep well covered, Mike. Don't worry. Why couldn't we have waited until tomorrow? The Indians wouldn't let us for one thing. For another, this will be a blizzard by morning. Oh, that's great. And the two of us in the canyon with the ghost pack. Let's hope we're out of the canyon by then. I don't like the sound of the place at all. Unking! The entrance of the canyon was narrow and forbidding. But as they neared it, the sergeant could see that it widened out beyond the opening. The floor was strewn with great snow-covered boulders. And toward the upper end, there was a thick growth of pine. Unking! Okay. See those woods up there, Mike? That's probably where Davis and Wallace have made their camp. It's a fine cover for them. And none for us on our way to get them. What's the matter with the rocks? Uh, we'll leave the team here and just take King with us. You know, I think you're good luck, Mike. And how do you figure that? Well, everything's working out so well. Davis and Walters bottle themselves up in a box canyon. The Indians lead us straight to it. All we have to do is go in and get them. I don't blame you for thinking we have an easy job up here. Sometimes we run into a lot of difficulty. Oh, uh, you do. I'm sorry I can't seem to provide you with any excitement. Can I give you credit, Sergeant, for doing your best? <laughs> the Indians had been holding a conference, and now the chief approached the sergeant. You go now. We're ready. You not come back till you find Nugget God. Don't worry. Uh, you not come back out. Cheerful bloke, isn't he? I suppose if we tried to come back out, they'd stick their spears into us. That's the general idea. Well, let's go. Come on, King. The sergeant with King by his side led the way into the canyon. Mike followed a few reluctant steps behind. The steep wall of the canyon, broken here and there by caves, towered on either side. But only a sure-footed animal could climb them. And the sergeant and King concentrated their attention on the woods ahead. They had covered half the distance to the woods when the great dog began to growl uneasily. What was the matter with him? He must have caught a sense. Follow me, Mike. We'll work our way forwards. One boulder to another. But they've got the advantage. They're hidden in the trees. They can see us, but we can't see them. They can't see us well. Our parkas are covered with snow. <laughs> Just then, a volley of shots rang out from the woods. The sergeant and Mike hit the ground. Can't see us, hmm? Well, they're coming mighty close with those shots. Yes. The light's failing, though. They can't keep us pinned down for long. What's that? Wolves. The ghost pack. The werewolves. They're somewhere up above us. That's right. They have their dens up in those caves Look. there. Look. Look, they're coming out. They're starting down the sides of the canyon. Are they coming after us? It looks that way. Oh, the saints preserve us. What a spot to be in. Outlaws in front of us, Indians behind. And the pack of ghosts or devils descending on us from above. If we can only turn them up the canyon, they may drive Davis and Walters into cover. We can do it. King, ready, boy? Mike Farrell found himself unable to move a muscle, and he could hardly credit the evidence of his eyes during the next few minutes. He saw the wolf pack racing toward him, and then King leaping forward to meet the leader. The sergeant was shooting fast on either side of the great dog. His bullets accounted for half a dozen of the gray phantoms, and King disposed of the leader. The pack began to circle the men and dog. Then Mike finally sprang into action and began to shoot. He saw what the sergeant was trying to do, 
not only to drive off the pack, but to force them to retreat up the canyon toward the woods. And at last he succeeded. The sergeant and King broke from cover. Where are you going? After them. They're starving. They'll catch the scent of Davis and Walter's dogs, and those crooks will have their hands full. Now's the time to close in on them. The sergeant had called to turn correctly. The wolf pack was heading for the woods now, and the outlaws' guns were turned on them. Preston, Mike, and King headed for the trees to the left of the killer's camp and reached cover as the wolves attacked the outlaws. Now, now what do we do? Follow me, Mike. We'll help drive off the wolves, and when we get rid of them, we'll be able to take our prisoners. The sergeant and Mike took cover behind two large trees less than 50 feet from the camp. They opened fire on the wolves who were circling the campfire. The new attack from the forest was too much for the pack. They started to run down the canyon. Davis and Walters stared after them, unable to realize for a moment that the fight was over, unaware that it was the sergeant and Mike who had turned the tide of the battle. But the sergeant's voice soon made them understand how vulnerable their position had become. Davis, you and Walters, drop your guns. You're covered. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. I give up. You're under arrest in the name of the queen. (laughs) And that was the simple end of the adventure. The huge nugget the men had stolen was found and returned to Raganu. The sergeant traveled with Mike and his prisoner all the way down to Skagway. They were locked in the ship's brig for the return trip. And as the steamer prepared to sail, the sergeant and Mike said goodbye. Ah, oh, it's been a pleasure working with you, sergeant. Oh, thanks, Mike. And with you too, King. Yes, sir, you're a fine detective. I'm sorry we couldn't find any excitement for you. Uh, Will you say that again? Well, I'm sorry it's been so dull. Mm. Just what did you put in your report? Why, the facts. Trail Davis and Walters, wanted for murder and bank robbery, the Ghost Pack Canyon. Arrested them. Returned large nuggets stolen by Davis and Walters to Regano. That's all. Oh, is it now? You didn't find it worth mentioning that those Indians were going to burn us alive? Why, no, there was no point in making trouble for them. They're simple people. If they're well treated, they're harmless. Regano understands now that he must call on the force if he has any grievance in the future. I see. And uh, couldn't you find a word for those werewolves who were trying to tear us limb from limb? They were only timber wolves. Oh, what's the use? What's the use? I'm beginning to understand now that one has to read between the lines of a Northwest Mounted report to find out what really happened. Don't you apologize to me for any lack of excitement. I told the superintendent this trip would be a vacation for me. Well, I'm going home for my vacation. After what I went through in that canyon, I'll need a long rest among those babes in arms that inhabit the Barbary Coast. I'll tell you the truth, Lieutenant. Oh, you'll admit at last that this was a tough assignment. It hmm? could have been worse. True, we might both be dead. <laughs> but I am willing to admit that I'm just as happy as you are that the case is closed. <laughs> Now, here's Sergeant Preston with a preview of our next adventure, the case of the Fantan Gold Robbery. When I first heard the story of the Fantan Gold Robbery, it appeared that a friend of mine named David Owen was involved in the crime. Dave was a family man, and I hated to think he was guilty. Luckily, King and I managed to turn up some new clues. But before we could clear Dave... There were some mighty dangerous and exciting moments for both of us. Be sure to listen to this exciting adventure next Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. The challenge of the Yukon will be brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, starting next Monday, September 12th. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck till next Monday. So long. Now, a listening reminder. The exciting adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy, will be heard over this ABC station this afternoon. You won't want to miss today's thrilling episode. So listen.